afternoon. When we were first told about the award luncheon, I was expecting a small group of about 50 people. So walking in, um, anxiety through the roof. Um, I didn't think I needed notes, but I have notes. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the combat veterans um, who went above and beyond in taking the leap of faith to share their stories for this class. Um, first off, my husband, Kevin Thompson, Brian Hanna, Frank Lombard, Andrea Norton, Nick Brown, and Dan Butcher. These six, six veterans served in Iraq and Afghanistan and took that leap to share their story in hopes that the students who were able to hear their stories would be deeply moved and find a passion for working with this population. And we found that that was definitely true for the students who completed this class. We also want to thank SAGE and CSWE for giving us a platform to talk about this very important issue. And we were very happy that during our session yesterday morning, even though there were 75 other sessions at the same time, we had over 20 people attend. So that was very exciting. We also want to thank the School of Social Work at Michigan State University. Um, very fondly, our interim director, Dr. John Meradian, um, who also had a lot of faith in us in being able to pull this off. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also wanted to acknowledge that in our approach to innovation and creation, it doesn't really come out of brainstorming. It comes out of relationships. It comes out of having relationships where you have a certain level of creative intimacy. It doesn't come from the ivory towers, but it comes from interacting with other human beings. And so in addition to our relationship, we have other people at Michigan State from IT services who played a crucial role in being a part of these relationships that enabled us to do what we believed we needed to do and wanted to do and that we could see in our minds to do. And that's Emily Brozovic, Kisa Johnson, and Christopher Irving. And it was out of those relationships that a unique sound came. So this class, Embracing the Stories of War, is going to be the first of three to prepare our MSW students to serve this population that has sacrificed so much to serve for us. Um, the certificate, this course, is about saving their lives, making sure that my husband does not become one of these 20 per day veterans who commit suicide. And we wanted to give the final word to one of our veterans. So bear with me. We weren't able to get the video, but we do have his audio. Hi, my name is Brian Hanna. I'm one of the combat veterans that uh, participated um, in helping bring this course together. I shared my stories, uh, my, my experiences uh, before, during, and after combat. Um, I felt that this was a very unique opportunity to share um, some of the things I went through and still go through, uh, as well as my family. And um, I also like the fact that it's so immersive and, and the students get to experience as much as possible about going to war without actually doing it. And at the same time, I also like how it's built off of um, understanding us and empathy rather than sympathy. We're not victims. You know, we, we signed up for this. This is uh, um, something we volunteered for. And... I just think this course is extremely unique in showing um, what we went through, how we went through it, why we think what we think, how we react to certain things, and what we have to deal with for the rest of our lives when it comes to um, interacting with others around us, uh, including our environment. And uh, when I first heard about this opportunity, I jumped on it. It's incredibly unique, and it allowed me to share some things that I'll be honest with you were locked in the back of my mind that I kind of stowed away someplace and didn't think about anymore. And uh, it was it was nice to uh, finally talk about that stuff without feeling like I was being judged. Um, so I look forward to interacting with the students every week when they ask us questions and, and we give back the answers from our individual points of views. And I look forward to uh, meeting them at the end of the course. So. Um, it's a real unique experience, and I hope that other universities uh, take note with, uh, with what this course is, is doing. Thanks. 
Hello, good afternoon. It, it's just a privilege to be here and to share this brief story with you about our project. And I'd like to offer my thanks to my colleagues, Anissa representing social work, Rebecca representing theology, and myself as a nurse educator, a longtime nurse educator in the field. We are an interdisciplinary partnership, um, collaborative, and um, have worked together about five years in this project. I would especially like to thank SAGE Publishing, CSWE, for the opportunity to be here today and to share in, in this honor. Uh, our, as I mentioned, our partnership has evolved, and we, um, we, we met each other and were grounded in the course, a theology course at the University of Portland, which is a private school and a Catholic university. <clears throat> the course was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the theological dimensions of suffering and death. And I personally um, contributed the initial project to the, to the course even before I began to teach in it. So it's got quite a journey. Uh, but the project itself emerged as a result of my own journey in suffering um, as a breast cancer uh, survivor. Anyway, as a result of my journey through breast cancer treatment and recovery, I experienced an, a tremendous gap in support. I, as a nurse, knew all about the physical dimensions of my needs, and those were met at every, at every intersection. But what I felt a gap in was the holistic, holistic care and support that went far, far deeper and went in, you know, uh, into my own family, into my professional practice, and just everything. I was transformed as an educator as a result of that. My husband uh, wisely counseled me to use that experience for good, to bring it forward into practice, and to equip students to be ready for practice, and to be ready to ask deep questions that needed to be asked of people. Uh, especially with life impacting suffering, that there's a difference of before and an after experience with that. So I do also thank my family and all of those people that have gone through suffering similar to my own, and all the people that we interview uh, that have shared their stories that our students encounter that, that we learn from and we realize the power of relationship as a result of this project. So I, I would like to just share just a few points about the project just to give you a hint of where we've been. Um, the project itself is an interview, two to three series or sessions, 30 to 45 minutes in, in length, um, based on a structured open-ended questions. It's quite scripted. Students are um, encouraged to find someone that's been through a, a significant suffering experience and grief and loss, depending on which course they're in. Uh, we send them into, with, we, we really ask for this initial encounter to be with friends and family, because I really feel students need initial encounters in safe spaces. And so um, they really feel th that they can address their own issues at the same time. So the interview is focused on the stories of suffering, the holistic elements, and then the emergence from suffering with a sense of meaning and purpose for closure. And, and what we have encountered is, is that students really realize their own personal needs, their own personal needs for healing in the process of this. And so uh, the themes that we've evaluated include uh, what the students take from this is a, a, a really increased self-awareness, expanded views of suffering, grasping the spiritual dimensions of self, and learning a compassionate and supportive art of presence. Uh, we really, the interview is laced with deep reflection at each point, at each interview following those, and um, so students go deep in interviewing as well as reflection. But what we've encountered is that our research has demonstrated the critical role of faculty that we need to accompany students and equip them uh, to, to be with them in these moments of shared vulnerability and to explore the, the personal nature as well as the professional impact of suffering. 
rather than allowing students to bumble through that, to not be accompanied. Um, I think students that I've always worked with hide that vulnerability. They uh, are, are wounded and yet afraid to come forward. But we really open the door, let them uh, to bear witness to their own and others' suffering and learn that art of presence that's super, super valuable for them. So again, uh, such an, we are just blessed to be here and we thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really impressed with the, uh, the groups uh, and all the honorees um, here today, and, and I am very honored uh, to be in your company. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, SAGE and the Commission on Research uh, for recognizing this work, and I'd also like to thank my dean, uh, Catherine Potter, uh, Associate Dean Antoinette Farmer, and our director of the MSW program, uh, Laura Curran, as well as my wife, Fontaine, who also teaches research. Um, they've all been so supportive and helpful. They encourage innovation and creativity and anything that's gonna get students engaged, especially in something like research, which all of you know students don't wanna take and can't see the point of it. And uh, uh, we, we have to constantly be doing a selling job to make them see that research is the basis of evidence-based practice, and it's important for them. So um, this agency, um, it's online, it has a website, it has programs, descriptions, it has uh, um, s descriptions of staff, the executive director, it has a budget. If you looked at it, you'd think it was an actual agency. But the good thing about it is that uh, it has data from the programs that students can go and download in a spreadsheet format and they can use any um, stat program to analyze the data and use it to write a paper, a program evaluation about uh, these programs. <clears throat> so I'm also grateful to the students who give me feedback about um, about the agency and um, students aren't afraid to tell you if there's a problem. So uh, it, it helps refine. Uh, it's a continuous process. I'm gonna be adding uh, more data and uh, more information to the site. And yesterday uh, at the workshop I did about this, I got some really good um, suggestions from other faculty who were there who suggested including uh, more qualitative information so that students could do a mixed method evaluation, which was a great idea, which I am gonna incorporate. But um, I thank you all, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Barbara, for that very gracious introduction, which I suspect may include some alternative facts. Nonetheless, I'm thrilled, honored, and deeply humbled to receive this award and particularly to share it with my esteemed colleague and good buddy, Jim uh, Mitt Joyner. <laughs> right over there. A very special thanks to Julie Watkins for her unrelenting advocacy to advance my nomination and to be here today. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of two of my children, Julie and Amy. You know, they say the apple never falls very far from the tree, but they also say sometimes the wind blows it. <laughs> and the wind blew Julie and Amy into remarkable women I am so proud of them. My husband is here in spirit. My gratitude to him is beyond words. In the footsteps of others who have won such awards, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people 
who stand out as my mentors over the years, and I wish they could be right here beside me so they could receive the recognition that they deserve. As Barbara said, I was born, didn't pronounce it this way, Barbara, in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And I attended McGill University where I received my MSW degree. Upon graduation, I decided to branch out and took a position working on the streets with gangs in Harlem, New York City. In preparation for this position, I read furiously about diversity and cultural competence and set forth with confidence, with excitement, with idealism, determined to change the world. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. But what did happen was that the kids in Harlem became my mentors. They were my mentors. From them, I learned firsthand the devastating impact of poverty and institutional racism. OMG, it was nothing like what I had read in the books. Most importantly, they taught me the presumptuousness of the quest for cultural competence, and particularly in a society as richly diverse as ours, and instead emphasized cultural humility, where we learn from our clients, and our clients become our teachers. After three years in Harlem, I went to Baltimore, Maryland, to join my husband, who was then a resident in neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I remember so vividly working with a group of parents at Hopkins whose children were receiving behavioral health care. And my thinking was, for goodness sakes, parents, get with the program. All you have to do is love and limit your children and pour water on them, and they will bloom and grow into productive, healthy adults. And guess what happened? I began to have children of my own. and discovered that parenting ain't that simple. So my belated thanks and apologies to this group of mentors, to this group of parents who knocked the smug out of me and reinforced the importance of personal humility. While at Hopkins, I also worked with a group of terminally ill children. They taught me the fragility of life. They taught me the importance of forcing myself to stay in the tunnel of their honest and raw despair, pain, and anger, and allow them to talk about their fears of the unknown and their concerns about dying and death. These children gave me a pair of earrings, which they called hearings. I get a little emotional about this. I wear these earrings tonight. I don't know if you can see them, but I wear these earrings that they gave me tonight to honor them. I wear them in honor of these unforgettable mentors. My time at CSWE, <clears throat> I'm getting cold from Barbara, it's all her fault. My time at CSWE has been a highlight of my career. I've benefited from multiple mentors, some of you in this room and others. Among the values instilled in me was a commitment to shared governance and inclusion in all CSW endeavors. 
So here we are one night, a group of 20 social workers, after a commission meeting, deciding to go to a Thai restaurant for dinner. Well, shared governance and inclusion had to prevail. Everybody had to have a voice in the decision. And we had to decide many things. Should we have individual glasses of wine or should we go the route of bottles? Should we have individual or family-styled courses? Should we have one shared bill or individual ones? Believe me, it took one hour for us to order that dinner. Every voice had to be heard. So the moral of this story is don't go to a Thai restaurant <laughs> with a group of social workers. But the real moral, however, is that democracy can be cumbersome. But democracy promotes the kind of social justice, dignity, and mutual respect that is so central to the soul of our profession and the mission of CSWE. A major mentoring format that has permeated throughout my career, and I've brought a show and tell has been the values of our profession and particularly our absolute commitment to social justice. And the COSA members, I am, as you suggested, showing the pin that you so kindly gave me. <clears throat> now is the time, now is really the time for us individually and collectively to rail against the lack of respect, dignity, and the injustice that is prevalent in these political perilous times. Yep. Advocacy and action must be our mantra. We cannot be bystanders. We have to be upstanders. We have to stand up for human rights. We have to stand up for social, economic, and environmental justice. And this is not an alternative fact. This is a categorical imperative. Thank you. So my my grandson, Jacob, just popped up. Um, he wasn't supposed to be here, but he did, so that, that's the message. This is uh, quite an honor, and I want to thank you, Sandra, for that glowing introduction that I told you not to do. I'm really humbled and grateful um, for having the honor of having the CSWE Award. So I want to thank the CSWE Awards Committee, the Board of Directors, all that nominated me, and everybody here for all that I do is working with you. All of you are part of this service and leadership award. But before I begin, I have to recognize my husband, Curtis. Um, Curtis has uh, been supportive of all that I do. Uh, I love him very much. Everything that I have is due to him. He's laughing because he's going to say, I want to hear those words later. Um, <laughs> but, but the real reality is we had twins and went 40 years ago. And he always says my career kind of took off 40 years ago because I like leaving him home with the twins while I traveled all over. So I want to also realize that my daughter, Jennifer, Nicole, and Jackie, are all here with me in spirit. They asked me if I, they should come, but it's also Howard's homecoming. And they looked at me and said, Mom? And I'm like, no, we all celebrated last week. Uh, I also want to recognize my son-in-law, David, and the two loves of my life. It's Quaid and Jacob, my grandsons. They're all supportive of all of my endeavors. 
And one thing that my parents taught me, so I'm going to recognize them as well, although they're no longer with us, but when they were raising kids, they always said that we are the greatest people in the world. But they also said we are no better than anyone else. And that always lived within me. Other individuals that I'd like to recognize is all of the recipients. Um, it seems to be an East Coast thing uh, because, you know, obviously we have the Significant Lifetime Achievement Award was at Boston College, and that's East Coast. And then Phyllis and I are both from Pennsylvania. And then obviously the Significant is in Maryland for um, receiving your award. So it's an East Coast thing. We'll throw out the challenge to the West Coast and you can come back next year. <laughs> Some other people that I'd like to recognize is Kathleen Whirlman, who I am now serving with. She is the president of NASW. Um, and also Angelo McLean, the CEO at NASW. They right now have to hear me in their ear, ask questions and ask questions and ask questions. So I want to thank them for being here. I also want to thank DMB First. I sit on the bank board and I saw that they bought an ad and I think that's a good way to get some, pub, uh, some um, other more money into these programs. And I want to thank Julia Watkins, who was the executive director at CSWE when I began. Um, we worked together for a long period of time, and it's great to see you. I want to thank Darla Spence Coffee. Darla's been in my life for a long period of time, all the way at Westchester University. I want to thank Sharon Reed, who's the executive assistant, who's the one that gets us where we need to be when we need to be there. And there's many other people, and I will mention them as I move along. I also want to thank CSU in Wilberforce, Ohio, where I became a BSW student. And when I left, they taught me the roles and responsibilities of being a social worker. But then I went and I, I practiced for a year and I went back and I went to Howard University. And I'm going to ask Dean Sandra Crew and Dr. Kudar Snell to stand for just one minute. The two of the, these two individuals are really the reasons why I continue to move forward. They've always been there. They've allowed me to vent. They've supported me. They always want me to do best. They want me to continue to do best, but it, it's just not that. They're my family, and I want to thank you because no one asked you to give your funds and sources to help me as I moved along, but you did so graciously, and I want to take time to thank you. Actually, uh, I'm really thankful for going to HBCUs. They taught me a lot while I was there. And at Howard University, you learned a lot about our legacy and about the individuals that walked on the campus from every area of the schools, be it social work, law, undergraduate. We knew that we were standing on the shoulders of giants and that we were expected to live up to their legacies representing the Mecca. And that has been something that I continue to do. At Howard, we were taught to stand up, speak up with intelligence about anything that we see that hampers or impedes the life of the most vulnerable people in our population. And we were told, because I was in the macro track, but it was the macro track, that you kind of have to take it from the macro track to the micro track, back up to the macro track. Um, I know we are in all of this tracking right now, but always remember the micro, the meso, and the macro should always work together to bring about change. So here I am receiving a, a, an award today when ironically the world is never, has been ripped apart by hate from our leadership, distractions every day in regards to the lives of women, people of color, 
and people who need the world's assistance. It's mind-boggling, actually, to me, because I never thought that I would see the madness that goes on every day. So really, today's social workers are needed more now than ever. And there are no safe places. We must risk. We've been taught to risk, even if we lose our job, in speaking up and making sure that we make sure that we have the voice for those who have no voice. So I want to remind you today that it's not only developing action, but executing that plan to bring about change. So these are the days that I actually get upset, and I, I kind of did that the other day, when we talk about associations such as CSWE, NASW, BPD, GAIDS, where all of the organizations and begin to question how much we should pay for those memberships. So I hope to shift the paradigm in that discussion to let you know that your associations are really your vehicles. They drive our voice. They drive our message. They help us get to that pathway of social justice. You don't want a broke down car. And so therefore, you have to pay those fees in order for us to ride in comfort and to make sure that the roads are paved. When Angelo and Darla and anyone goes to the Hill, they want to know how many social workers there are. And that will get our voice to the table of change. So I ask you today to really think about associations and not so much ask what they can do for, for you, but you ask what you can do for them. Because if we don't have them, our world will be so different. Going to the Hill is something, and, and keeping up, and Angelo's always pushing out these reactions that we get from the White House. And it's important that we have that voice. But it takes dollars, it takes commitment, and it takes your membership. So as an African-American mom, who's a grandmom, people always question, why do you continue to do the work that you do? Why do you continue? You can sit back and enjoy life, and I do. But as I mentioned, I have two beautiful grandsons who will one day be an African-American young man. And as my husband told me when one of them was born, I fear for their lives. Because as they grow and question, will they get stopped one day by the police? Will they move in a way that makes someone think that they're going after a weapon? Will they mouth off? Because we taught them, they have me as their mom, to mouth off, <laughs> grandma. And what? if they do. And then I realized that there's other grandmoms just like me, the grandmom of a transgender youth, the grandmom of a Mexican child that might be sent back because they brought them here at the age of three. All of us need all of you every day to work on the message that social work actually taught us that value, that code of ethics, that belief in social justice, that belief that we should have a world that is safe for everyone, no matter their race, their creed, their sexual orientation, their religion. We should never let anyone in higher office dictate our values, the values to be free. So I'm going to end with my favorite author, I mean poet, because he had a poem that actually speaks to the global issues for all of us. There is a dream in the land with its back against the wall. 
by muddled names and strange. Sometime the dream is called. There are those who claim this dream for theirs alone, a sin for which we know they must atone. Unless shared like sunlight and like air, the dream will die for lack of substance anywhere. The dream has no frontier or tongue. The dream, no class or race. The dream cannot be kept secure in any one locked place. This dream today, in battle with its back against the wall, to save that dream for one, it must be saved for all. Our dream of freedom. Thank you so much. I'm going to sit, but I think you'll be able to hear me. Um, thank you again for that most wonderful introduction. And I don't think all of it is quite true, but I certainly welcome it. Um, I'm not going to thank the people who nominated me just yet. I'm going to do that at the end because I want them to stay here since many of them are deans and hear what I have to say. So I'll do that at the end. But my, my comments today are really about our profession's journey from social apartheid to social justice. And I question whether it was a journey or a struggle. And I'm going to ask you to reflect with me. My childhood was in a small rural town in central Florida, Ocala, in Marion County. Plessy versus Ferguson was the law of the land, spewing a philosophy of separate but equal, which was always unquestionably separate and unequal. During my first year at elementary school, there were six racially motivated lynchings that were documented nationally. There were also bombings, beatings, and other domestic terrorist acts towards people of color. My elementary school secretary's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Harry T. Moore, were killed by a bomb in their home on Christmas night in 1951. In our home on Gary Farms, which was my grandfather's place, the illegality of voter suppression and the positive force for voting rights were always discussed. There we learned that blacks stood up for their rights and drew on their historical knowledge and wisdom regarding survival strategies, and that also included protest. Achieving a decent education was difficult or nearly impossible for African Americans, and that was the case for much of my life. In fact, in the South, education was once criminalized. My family was active in the push for social justice. She's already mentioned that. At Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, my interest only grew, and I was taught by and associated with those who were in the black vanguard, as well as white and Jewish faculty. More than anyone, Whitney Young, the first black president of NASW, recruited me to social work and specifically macro community practice. And he suggested that one day you should get a doctorate. I was well on my way at that time to law school. While finishing college and continuing my graduate education at Atlanta University School of Social Work, I remained active in the Atlanta student movement. That is where I marched and I was arrested for protesting my rights 
and civil rights of all of the people. So I was one of the first women in the South to be arrested in the sit-ins as I prepared to go to graduate school of social work. Thank you. Although social work might not have embraced social justice enthusiastically, our completely friendly assistance and social control were extended to the disadvantaged. And two parallel systems of delivery emerged, one for Euro-Americans and one for others, indigenous people, African-Americans, and Latinos. The profession engaged in what I call service delivery apartheid. The separate but unequal pattern of social life in much of the country was also that what occurred in our profession. It is the history that we deny since we sanitized the narrative, one that we're not necessarily proud of, especially now that we profess a commitment to social justice and justice-driven values. If social justice had not been an implicit value, it did beca not become very explicit until the 1980s. The profession is surely challenged as it addresses social justice now in the context of greater diversity, change in demographics, and a geopolitical context that is increasingly intolerant of justice-driven values and social rights and more accepting of neoliberalism, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia, and every other ism. Given this reality, the profession must commit to a deeper understanding of the impact of inequality and how it created historical unfairness and privileged certain cohorts. This is especially true of economic inequality, which has grown exponentially over the last generation. There can be no unity in this country until inequality is defeated. This is the challenge that social work faces and must address. So we need to ask, what can the profession do? I just have a few ideas and I'll share them briefly. Once the profession should accept the meaning of privilege and the reality of reduced privilege for certain groups and the resistance that all have witnessed via the increased polarization and the various alliances of hate. Think about Charleston and think about Charlottesville and more recently the attempts in Gainesville, Florida near my hometown. The inability to comprehend the meaning of whiteness and the privilege that is associated with it did not redound to poor whites. That is a basis for their anger. A consequence of inequality is the increase in class division, which also fuels discontent relative to race and to gender, sexual orientation, and national origin. Now let's be clear. The founding fathers wanted this country to be white. They advocated white supremacy and elitism. These principles were embedded in the Constitution when only white men were given the right to vote and to own property. And my friends, that was the origin of affirmative action. In their community, there was little, if any, inequality. Of course, there were slaves, there were their women, and indentured servants, indigenous people, but they were not viewed as equals. However, the ideals expressed at that time were unique among constitutional governments of that time in a world that had known nothing but feudalism and authoritarian governments. Second, the profession should develop a broader curriculum which would include content on economic structure and process. This would help prepare professionals for understanding the angst stemming from groups who feel alienated and the emergence of new political movements. Social workers deal with the impact of inequality, but we do not address prevention. Instead of advocating equal 
and exact justice, that is what Thomas Jefferson said. We merely speak of macro injustices and call for economic justice, environmental justice, and social justice. And then we structure the curriculum around micro interventions where we locate structural problems within the individual and in the family and in small groups. What a contradiction. And third, the profession should develop the capacity to participate more effectively in political environment. The dual efforts to engage in voter suppression and curtail demographic changes owing to xenophobia in vogue from the nation's high office is not just rolling back the clock 50 years with particular harm to people of color and new immigrants, but with threats to democracy itself. Social work's voice must be stronger, and it must be stronger now. Too few of us hold elective office in state legislatures, in Congress, and we exert too little influence. The curriculum can be reshaped to include content that can better facilitate knowledge about civic participation and build confidence in our students so that they are not afraid to become effective change agents and social justice warriors. We might revisit that old reformer. Her name was Jane Addams. And while we're at it, we ought to also visit W.E.B. Du Bois, who gave us the basis for the strengths perspective and mixed methods research. And we ought to revisit Ida B. Wells Barnett, who gave us information on research and anti-lynching. And we ought to revisit Whitney Young, Jr., who was the advisor to Martin Luther King, three United States presidents, and the Atlanta student movement. Fourth, the profession should learn that leadership matters. Look to those who I just mentioned, Adams, Wells Barnett, Du Bois, Young, and so many others, including the people who have been recognized so beautifully here today before me. Predictions are that women will maintain their dominance in the profession, although their numbers will continue to decline in the national workforce. They will hail from poor and immigrant status and refugee status, and they'll be from rural communities as well as inner cities. The challenge for us then is to provide them the very best education we can, since they will be looking for upward mobility for themselves and their families and their clients and the communities in which they live. They will not bring the human capital investment in education that Jane Addams brought to the field. In this regard, we need new innovative models and designs for professional study, including online programs, second language offerings, simulated practice and distance supervision and robotic technology will all be imperative given the cost, language, and transportation barriers. And finally, the profession should understand that messaging and language must become more inclusive and include an emphasis on social rights for all. We have to stop. Thank you. We have to stop dodging certain concepts and deal with them, although that will produce some discomfort. For example, we have to talk about race, not just diversity. And we have to talk about injustice, not just disparities. It is the injustice that causes the social disparities. And we have to talk about equal justice and exact justice and not just social justice and environmental justice. I have witnessed our profession's movement 
from apartheid when black and other social workers of color could not serve white clients. And I know that some agencies would not serve certain immigrants. For example, the Irish in Boston. I know those stories well because I was at BC for 24 years. And yet, we have overcome all of the barriers that were part of our realities. And we have moved forward. And as we have done that, I suggest that there is much more for us to do. And last, I want to thank you and I know that I am a member of a great profession. And what we have to do is simply make it greater. I want to thank you. I want to thank you. Hold on just a minute. I want to thank these people who I said I didn't want to leave. A special thanks to my dean, Anna Shayette, from the University of Georgia, over here, and Dean Jenny Jones. She was over here. I don't think she left. All right, from Clark Atlanta, since I'm a graduate of Atlanta University, for nominating me for this award. I would like to thank former deans Bonnie Yegedis and Maurice Daniels from the University of Georgia. And I also have to thank Drs. Harold Briggs, Tony Lowe, also from the University of Georgia, Waldo Johnson, and Dean James Herbert Williams, and Dean Darrell Wheeler for their support. I would also like to thank all of my colleagues and students from Boston College, where I worked for 24 years, and I learned way more from all of them than I think they ever learned from me. And I would also like to thank my colleagues from the University of Georgia, and several of them are here. I've been with them for 17 years. I must say that I have to thank my students. Several are here, and many of them are in high offices now. And it's my students who have taught me more than any other group. And therefore, representing all of my students for over the years is Dr. Angela McLean, who was the CEO. He is at NASW, but he was my student at BC. Now, I thank all of you very sincerely and deeply, but I want you to know that I share this award with my sisters, who were all of us were taught to read by my grandfather, W.P. Gary, who bought our books so that we did not have to have books handed down from the white students at the big school. You know what I mean? He saw some value in that. So he taught us all how to read. And so I share this award with my three sisters, Dr. Faye Gary, Dr. Gladys Gary Vaughn, and Dr. Ollie Gary Christian, and my only brother, Homer Gary, the manager of Gary Farms. I also appreciate very sincerely the family that I had, my parents, Ollie and Homer Gary, and my grandfather, W.P. Gary. Now, my family is represented today. There's someone from each generation, my granddaughter Jasmine, who's been helping me, and my nephew, attorney Bill Harris, and several cousins who are all at this table, and many friends who are here to be with me when I receive, as I have received this award. And more than anyone, I share this award and this day with my late husband, Dr. John Hobbs. I thank you.